Another Christmas carol that we sing goes like this. We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we travel afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Now, we didn't sing that particular carol today, but I got to tell you that we're not quite sure that they're really kings. As a matter of fact, we're, we're not quite sure that there were three of them. They gave three gifts, and so we assume that there were three. But, uh, well, it, it, it kind of creates, as we look at the Christmas story, perhaps a differing thing. But here's what we do know about these, well, wise men, is that they were wise. And we call them wise men because they were seeking Jesus they were wise because when they came and they found Jesus, they bowed down and worshiped him. And they were wise because they laid their treasures before Jesus. And as we look at the wise men, what we realize today is that wise people still do the same thing. Wise people still seek him. They still worship him. And they still bow down and lay their treasures before them. And so we're going to be looking at those three things today as we look at this Christmas story from the perspective of the wise men. I'm in Matthew chapter 2 today, verses 1 through 12, and then verse 16. And if you know me, I'll just kind of go through the passage. And I want to make those three points again as I go through the passage. Wise men today, wise women today still seek him, still worship him, still lay their treasures before them. So let's take a look at the first. Wise people today still seek Jesus. They were seeking him. You know, some of us are here today, and I've been a pastor long enough to know that Christmas Eve is, is kind of one of those times where people start to reflect and think and ask questions. And some of us are here today, if we get honest, because we're seeking and we're asking questions and we're looking for, is there more to life than what I know? Uh, we're seeking truth, and really at the heart of this, and the Bible explains it, is in Ecclesiastes, we are told that God has set eternity in our hearts. And what that means is God has given us an eternal hunger in our hearts that nothing in this world can fill. And so we try to fill it. We try to fill it with chemicals, with relationships, with activities, with possessions. We try to fill it with all of these things, but nothing works because God has set eternity in our hearts. And what we look at today is that wise people still seek him, still look for him because we have this hunger, this thirst, this craving that nothing else will fill, nothing in this world will fill. Here is what we read, Matthew 2, beginning with verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, in, when it rose and we have come to worship him. Now, Magi, here's another thing we know about these, well, wise men. They are called Magi. Now, Magi were probably from Persia, probably from modern-day Iran, where modern-day Iran is. And so they journeyed more than likely a thousand miles, a hundred days journey to make it to Jesus. The Magi were astrologers who looked at the stars. They were the magicians. They were a part of the Zoroastrian faith. But here's what they're doing. They're thinking to themselves, there's something more than what we believe. There's something more than what we have. There has to be something more than what we see in the stars. And God revealed something to them so that, he, so that they were drawn and they were driven ultimately to Bethlehem to worship the one that would be born king. And so here they were seeking truth, journeying a thousand miles, journeying over thief-infested road, roads, over hard roads, difficult roads, leaving their families, leaving their places of employment perhaps, as they made finding Jesus, seeking Jesus a priority. And that's exactly what they did as they made their way to Jerusalem. How far would you go? As a matter of fact, how far have you gone to seek truth? Are you seeking truth? Are you there? Are you really saying, God, I've got this eternal void on the inside that nothing is filling. Are you seeking him? These wise men were seeking him. And so the Magi go straight to Jerusalem thinking, okay, if the king of kings is to be born, surely he will be born in one of Herod's magnificent palaces. The king of the Jews at that point was Herod. The one who was being born king of kings was even greater than Herod, and they thought he's got to be in a palace. And so they journey to Jerusalem, to Herod's palace. Well, they don't find him there. Here's what we read in verse 3. When King Herod heard this, that they were looking for the king of the Jews, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. And the reason why is, if you know history, Herod was a psychopath. 
And, when he, and so here's what he did. He called together all of the chief priests, all of the teachers of the law, and he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? And so immediately when they come journeying from afar, looking for the king, looking for the one born king of kings, he immediately knows they're talking about the Messiah. Now, he doesn't know scriptures, and so he calls together people who know scriptures, our Old Testament, and they say, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they respond, verse 5, in Bethlehem, they say, in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Now, notice that he asked to ask the chief priests and the teachers of the law because he doesn't know where the Messiah is going to be born. And notice that, that, that they're not looking either. Notice that they know what the prophecies say, but they're not looking. As a matter of fact, they're not seeking. And so I wonder how the wise men must feel traveling from Persia all the way to Jerusalem only to find out that no one else really has made finding this king a priority. Not Herod, not the chief priests, not the teachers of the law. Verse 7, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He then sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, here's what we know, and we find this out later on in the passage. He has no intent on worshiping Jesus. I mean, as a matter of fact, he has no intent on worshiping anyone other than himself. And, and this is who Herod is. He's, he's seeing now Jesus as a threat to himself, as a threat to his own kingdom, as a threat to his own power. And so he sends the Magi on deceptively saying, go and tell me where he is so that I too may worship. Herod was this kind of person. As a matter of fact, we know from history that Herod was so power crazy that he killed two of his own wives and three of his own sons just to try to keep power, just because he suspected that they might be trying to take power from them. That's who he was. Caesar Augustus, who was the Roman emperor at this point, was quoted as saying, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son, because that's how Herod was. And that's who Herod was. So t take a look at the broader theme of what's happening here, and I'll end with this, but you have two kings colliding in history. One who comes and he's born in a stable, one who lives in the palaces, one who is bent on violence and power, the other one who gives it all up and shows that power truly comes in service and in weakness and ultimately in death. And here you have on the face of this history, you have two kings colliding. Verse 9, after they had heard Herod, the wise men, they went on their own way, and the star they had seen when they went on rose again and it guided them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Then when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So notice as they're leaving, the star reappears, and God guides them then to Bethlehem, to where Jesus ultimately is. And what does this tell us about God? This tells us that God wants to be found by us. He's saying, I, I want to be found by you. If you're seeking me, I want you to find me. I want you to understand where I am. I want you to know who I am. If you're seeking me, I want to reveal myself to you. This is who God is. And notice the joy that they have as they come in ultimately to worship and to bow down before Jesus. So wise men today still seek him. Wise women, wise people today still seek him. Number two, they not only were seeking Jesus, but they worshiped Jesus. Verse 11 says this, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Now, the word worship means worth-ship. It comes from the Old English worth-ship, basically what is most worthy in our life. And what the word implies is this. You and I are going to worship whatever we value the most, whatever we consider the most worthy. And the truth of the matter is, is that we are all worshipers. You might be here today and you're saying, well, I don't really even believe in God. Well, God would say you are still a worshiper. We all will end up worshiping whatever we value the most, whatever we consider to have the most worth. Uh, a great illustration of this was run by CNN about seven years ago. And CNN ran a story about a guy named Rick who lived in Fresno, California. And Rick was out garage sale shopping. And so he was out trying to find some deals, and he came across one particular box of glass, old glass photographic prints. 
Back when they used to actually print on glass the, the images and then they would make prints off of the glass and he picked them up and he looked at them and he said, okay, these must be, wow, they must be 80, 90, maybe 70 to 90 years old. Uh, I'll buy them. I wonder if they're worth anything, but I'm not quite sure. He asked the guy selling them, how much are you charging? The guy said, I'll take 70 bucks. Rick said, all I've got is 45. Will you take 45 for this box of prints? And the guy says, sure, take it off my hands for $45. So Rick takes this box of glass prints and he goes home and he shoves it under his pool table and, and the glass prints stay under the pool table literally for 10 years. And every now and then he cleans around that area and he notices the box of prints and he goes back, he kind of looks at them a bit. Finally, after 10 years, he said, you know what, I need, to find, I need to find out whether they have any value. I need to find out whether there's something to these glass prints. And so he goes ahead and CNN was interviewing him and, and, and he said, I took it into the appraisers and they looked at it and they said, these are Ansel Adams originals worth $200 million. And, and you, might, you, you might all of a sudden look at that and say, wow, that, that, that's huge. That must have completely changed Rick's life and it did. I can't help but think, however, that many of us treat Jesus like that box of prints. That many of us, when we approach Jesus, instead of seeing him as being of the highest value, we kind of end up shoving him away somewhere. We kind of end up compartmentalizing Jesus in some way or some form or some fashion, and we don't really worship. And then we go on to other things that perhaps we think even more important. And this is kind of what's happening as we look at the wise men. They're coming in, and Jesus is immediately their highest value. Now, you only worship a king, and they bowed down. Uh, you only worship a god, excuse me, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him as that. And Jesus became, as they journeyed this far away, their highest value. He became for them an object of worship, and truly, they bowed down and worshiped him. The Bible says that we are all worshipers, and we will all give ourselves, we will all spend ourselves on whatever it is that we worship. In Romans chapter 1, Paul describes this. He says, of people who don't worship God, he says they exchange the truth of God for a lie, and they begin to worship created things rather than the Creator, and they begin to worship and serve these created things in Romans 1. And what this tells us is that you and I are going to serve whatever it is that we worship. We're going to give ourselves and spend ourselves on whatever it is that you and I will worship. Let me explain. If we worship money, we're going to set our hearts on money. We're going to desire money above all else. We're going to make life's decision based on how can we get more money. Our pursuit of money will affect how we date, who we marry, how we parent, how we relate to others, basically how we live. If we worship power, kind of like Herod did, we will set our hearts on power. We will desire power above all else. We will make life's decisions based on how can we get more power. Our pursuit of power will determine how we date, who we marry. It will determine how we parent. It will determine how we live if we worship pleasure. Our pursuit of pleasure basically is going to determine how we live. We're going to set our hearts on pleasure. We're going to make life's decisions based on how do we get more pleasure. Our pursuit of pleasure will determine how we date, who we marry, how we parent, everything about us. If we worship Jesus, if we worship Him, we will set our hearts on Jesus. We will desire Jesus above all else, knowing that only He can fill this emptiness in our soul. We will make life's decisions based on how can we get more Jesus in our life. Our pursuit of Jesus will affect how we date, who we marry, how we parent, how we relate to others. You see, whatever we worship is going to revolutionize our entire life. Our life will be spent on whatever it is that we worship. Some of us are sitting here today and we're, we're here and if we get honest, we've made some pretty lousy decisions and choices in our life and we're scratching our heads thinking, how could I have made bad choices? And it could be as we look at the Christmas story, the bad choices come because we're worshiping the wrong things. We're valuing the wrong things. We're setting our hearts on the wrong things. And because we set our hearts on the wrong things, we end up doing the wrong things. Jesus says, set your hearts on me. Worship me. Only, only in worshiping me will you find freedom. Everything else will enslave you. And so wise people today, well, they still seek him. They still worship him. And then thirdly, they lay their treasures before him. 
Part 11, verse 11, second part of it says this, Then these wise men, they opened their treasures and presented Jesus with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They worshiped Jesus basically by giving him whatever they had of value. They opened up their treasure chests, literally. Now, why did they do this? Why ultimately did they give to Jesus whatever they had of value? Clearly, it's because they found in Jesus something more valuable. They found in Jesus true treasure, and so then they gave their treasures ultimately to him. Jesus later goes on to tell us that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. And what he is saying is treasure was going to act as a magnet to our hearts. And wherever we put our treasure, it's going to act as a magnet to our hearts. Our treasures are not only our resources, but our opportunities, our time, our talents, even our life. And we're all going to spend it on something. Jesus says, spend it on me. Only in spending it on me will you find a life that is worthwhile. Only in spending it on me will you find what I have come to give, which is not only eternal life, but abundant life. And look at the treasures that they gave. They gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, these three gifts were prophetic to a certain extent because gold is a gift for a king, incense is an offering to a god, and myrrh is a burial spice. So why would they give a baby gold, incense, and myrrh? Because God had revealed to these people as they had traveled ultimately who this baby was. He was a king. He was God. He would die for our sins. Gold, incense, and myrrh. This is what they gave. But the story isn't quite over yet. Verse 12, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, the wise men returned to their own country by another route. Notice that God had to warn them. Notice that they, they bought Herod's deception. They thought, this guy really does want to go and worship the king of kings. And so they were going to go back and tell Herod where Jesus was. God had to warn them in a dream, don't do that. Herod, his mind and his heart are somewhere else. Skip ahead to verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. So Jesus is born to be king. And as he comes onto the pages of history and into this world, he collides with yet another king, King Herod. Herod is based and built all about power and prestige and status. Jesus gives up all prestige, all status, to become a, a baby, coming to us born to an unmarried mom and a penniless father. This is how far he came. And as you look at Herod, you can go to Israel today and still see everything from the temple to Masada to, to other, other places that he built. He lived in opulence. Jesus had nothing. On the face of history, these two kings collide. As a matter of fact, as you look at Jesus and Herod, there's only one thing that they had in common. Go back to verse 16 and you'll see it. They both were completely convinced that there was nothing that bloodshed couldn't handle. Herod willingly shed the blood of anyone that stood in his way. Jesus shed his own blood that you and I might have forgiveness, that you and I might have life, that you and I ultimately might live. So on the pages of history, two world systems collide, two kings collide. And you and I have to answer the question, am I seeking Him, Jesus? Am I worshiping Him? Am I laying my treasures before Him? What will I do with Jesus? So I want to ask you that just as we close. Some of us might be here today because we genuinely are worshiping Jesus and we have come to genuinely worship Him. Others of us, let's get honest. Maybe we're a bit convicted because we've kind of been treating Jesus like that box of prints. And for us, Jesus is kind of relegated and compartmentalized, and we haven't yet fully seen the whole value of everything that he is. And then yet some of us are seeking him, desiring him, desiring what he came to give, and in our hearts there is an emptiness that only he can fill. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, some of us are here today because we truly do want to worship you. 
And we do so, Jesus. We worship You with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind. Others of us are here today and we've been treating You, Jesus, a bit like that box of prints, if we get honest. We haven't valued You the way that we should. We haven't worshipped You the way that we should. Forgive us. Jesus, we're asking that You may become our most valued possession as You possess and come in and own, if You will, us and our souls. And Lord, some of us, as we are here, we're still seeking. Jesus, You came to be our sacrifice. Dying, You took on Yourself the death that each of us deserved because of our sin. So Jesus, if this is us, today we want to ask You, would You be our Lord? Would You be our King? Would You be our Savior? Jesus, I want to give myself wholly to You. I want to give You my life, my will, my future. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for worshiping and valuing the wrong things. I want to turn from all that, and I want to turn from You. Jesus, give me everything that You came to give. Make me new. Make me Your own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.